won't notice it. It weighs about one gram. So does anyone have any questions? Or, or, OK, so today I'm going to, well, last time I ended with something that I didn't quite finish doing. I'll just remind you very briefly, which was a question to you. It was kind of homework, if you want to think about it. I explained how you could find the asymptotics of the prod product 1 minus q to the n, which, of course, we know is a modular function as q goes to, not to infinity, as q goes to 1, using the Euler-Maclaurin method. And that has applications to the circle method. And later, I'll come back to this in the course and uh, also when q goes to minus 1 or root of unity using the shifted Euler-Maclaurin. And that will have an application. But the, the uh, ex that I kind of carried out briefly. But the exercise was to do the same for what's called the McMahon function, which is known to be the generating function for plane partitions, as they're called. And so the question was, if anybody wanted to amuse themselves trying to find the exact asymptotics of that. So I don't want to ask now if anybody's done it, because I'll come back to such questions in a week or so when I'm going to come back to the circle method and some of the things that I mentioned actually in my talk last week of the Ramanujan date that many of you heard. So there's another function. It's called the P2 star. Uh, so I can add to the list of questions you might want to think about to test whether you really have learned how to apply that method. Because as I told you, that method is useful you know, once a month in your mathematical life. You can, you'll have a function of the form sum f of nt and want to understand it. And then these were nice, not completely trivial applications of that method. So if you want to know whether you understood it well, these two variants of the original 1 minus q to the n, where you either take 1 minus q to the n to the n, or 1 minus, if you want, this would be q to the n to the n inside the brackets, so q to the n squared. Those are both very nice examples. But I don't want to discuss them now. I don't want to ask who tried the exercise, because I'll be coming back to this in a week or two. But I thought I would add one more question and remind you that it was meant as a homework problem. You're under no compulsion. Nobody will check. But if you like the method and want to be sure you can use it in a non-trivial situation that might, you might encounter, these are very good test problems because it's not entirely trivial. They don't obviously have the right form. And you have to fiddle a little to, to make it work. So as I said, I'll be coming back to that in connection. So in particular, both of these have interesting generating functions. So this is known, although I don't think Major McMahon knew it when he wrote it down. This is the number of plane partitions of n, or solid partitions they're sometimes called. It's really more solid. If you think of a usual partition, like 5 might be 4 plus 2 plus 1, and then you make this, or 4 plus 2 plus, well, 6 could be 5, 4 plus 2 plus no, 8 could be 4 plus 2 plus 2. You make a Young diagram. So you, you put in the corner of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the right quadrant, you put a line of square of bricks, then another line of bricks above it, and one that it can't stick out. You can't, you, you can't have that. And then you count them with n squares. And you can do exactly the same in three dimensions. So you put one cube in the corner, and then you put a line. So on the bottom line, you'll have a Young diagram. And then on the next line, you'll have another Young diagram above it that doesn't stick out. And so you can do a cube. And of course, you can do it in any dimensions. But nobody in the world has any di idea how to write down the generating function in dimension 4. But strange enough, in dimension 3, it turned out, I don't know who proved that. I think physicists, it is the same as McMahon's function. And this one, of course, is an even more obvious interpretation. This was already in the paper of Hardy and Littlewood. This is the sum q to the end of the number of partitions of n into squares. And this was already treated in the famous 1918 paper of Hardy and Littlewood, uh, Hardy and Ramanujan, I mean. And uh, as I mentioned in the talk last Monday that some of you heard, it, it's much more subtle than the original one, it has many surprising uh, aspects. And so I would like to talk about it in this course because it is asymptotic and it's recent research, so I'm not only telling things of you know, 30 years ago. 
So I will come back to both of these, and eventually the object will be not to understand the asymptotics of these function, but to understand the asymptotics of these numbers. But for that, use the hardy ramanujan and later, later Radomacher and Littlewood circle method. And for, so there are two stages. You have to know exactly how this function behaves, near one and near every root of unity, and then you use it. It's a two-step process. And the first part, you don't need even though Hardy thought you did need, you don't need the multilinearity. These functions are both not multilinear at all, but it works perfectly well. But for the second part, uh, well, if you haven't been able to do the first part, you'd be stuck. You can do it, but it has a lot of new subtleties. So that's just an announcement advertising for a future lecture. OK, so now I want to come to the subject for today. And so let me say the general problem. I mentioned this in the introductory lecture of the course. There's going to be a general problem, and then there'll be a less general problem that I'll reduce it to, a special problem, and then there'll be a more general problem. But I'll talk about those later. I want to state the general problem very briefly. I stated it already in the opening lecture. And then I don't want to talk about the solution yet. I want to give several examples. Because the thing with the Euler-McLaurin form, not Euler-McLaurin, sorry, well, generalized Euler-McLaurin, sums of the form f of nt, that I said, of course, these are meaningless guesses, I said, you will encounter something like that once a month in your mathematical life. Of course, it depends what kind of mathematics you do. Let's say I encounter such sums like that quite often, although they may be a little hidden. So this is useful. But this problem I'll talk about here, depending what mathematics you do, but let's say in my case, I encounter problems where I can use this, I would say, three times a week. And I found this trick like 20 years ago, so you can work out how many times I've used it. And I've shown it to a lot of friends, and so many of them could use it on some numbers that they had immediately. It's not new. I said that before. It's essentially equivalent to various in extrapolation methods that were known. But they're, at least the way they're presented in the books, it's more complicated than the way I see. So most people don't actually know them. This one, I can guarantee, once I've shown you with the mnemonic, you can't forget. It's so obvious that you think, well, of course, that's what you do. And it's super simple. The program, let's say in Paris, uh, to do this extrapolation is typically one line long, and not one of my lines that are like that, but a, a real line. So it's very easy. So the problem is, is this, and I'll try to be fairly specific. Given a sequence of numbers, say real or complex, they might as well be real. You could take the real and imaginary part of numbers uh, let's say a n, n greater than or equal to 1. But I have to explain what I mean by given. Is it given in closed form? Is there a simple as, for instance, if it's given as an asymptotic formula, then the, the question I'm about to ask is empty, because the question is, can you recognize the asymptotics? So in the sense that you can calculate Any given one, so there's an algorithm or maybe a closed formula, any given uh, a n in a reasonable amount of time. So let's say you could compute a n for n less than maybe 100 or maybe 1,000 in another case. But I don't mean that you can compute a n if n is 10 to the 1 million. Then you wouldn't have to do anything. You could just see the asymptotics if n is practically equal to infinity. But so typically, we'll have a problem that it costs money, meaning time, on the computer to compute. So if you let the computer run for half an hour, you get 100 values. If you let it run for a day, you might get 1,000 values. But if you want a million values, you'll have to let it run for the rest of your life. You don't want to do that. So the question is, you have a limited value. So it's a limited number. So limited number. That's very important for the application, that you don't need a lot. And there's a small improvement on that that I'll say later. But the other is, but you know those numbers to high precision. So in other words, I may be, well, only use the first 100 numbers. Remember, I'm doing asymptotics. So you have to take, I mean, you can't take three numbers and make asymptotics of a1, a2, a3. That makes no sense. Let's say I have 100, and you might draw a graph, and it seems to you know, have some behavior. But I do need to know these numbers to very high precision. So if I need 100 digits, or if I, some ask I need only 20 digits, or 50, or 1,000, depending how many numbers I have and how much accuracy I want for the final asymptotics, these numbers should be calculable to high precision. Now, sometimes there's no problem of precision. They're integers. 
So they're exact numbers, or they're rational numbers, or they're algebraic numbers. But sometimes they aren't, but you can compute still each one if you want to 50 digits or 100 digits. So that's the input. That's what I mean for this problem by given. It's not given necessarily by formula, or there may be a formula that doesn't make the answer to this question clear. I just had a question, such a question from Emmanuel, who's sitting there. Numbers where we have a closed formula, but it doesn't make the asymptotics clear at all. So one wants to do some kind of interpolation. OK. Uh, uh, for which you think, for which you expect growth like, and now I'll put in several parameters. But as I said, this is the general problem. I'll have a special case in a second and reduce the general problem to the special one. And then later in the lecture, I'll have, or maybe next lecture, I'll have generalizations where you allow more parameters. But the simplest one would be as n tends to infinity. First of all, it might grow factorially. Or it might, it might like square, factorial square. So that's, that's actually got a name. It's called Jeffrey type gamma. But let's say, sorry, I was calling that alpha. I don't want to change my notation for my notes. So n factorial to the alpha. Now once we've removed that, it should have less than factorial growth. The next most common growth after factorial is exponential. So there might be some positive number, maybe some uh, actually could be even a, an alternating number, and that sometimes happens, an algebraic number, anything, beta to the n. Then once you've removed that, it no longer has exponential growth. What's the next most familiar growth, less than factorial, less than exponential? Of course, it's power growth. So then we might have n to the gamma, so alpha, beta, gamma are constants. But then, once I've removed all of that, it should have a limit. Let's call the limit c0. And if you subtract that limit, it should be something over n plus c2 over n squared. So this is a very, very common situation. Not every nice function, even very smooth analytic functions, may not have quite this behavior. As I say, in the generalization, I'll allow more parameters and more things. And you can also have fewer. For instance, you can just start a n has a limit, and you want to find the limit, which will be the special case. So here, c0, c1, et cetera, are constants. So that's what you expect. And the problem is, find. By the way, these are in order of importance. Alpha is dominant. After alpha, beta is the next dominant. After beta, gamma. After gamma, c0. After c0, c1, and so on. So you have an infinite sequence of numbers that's numbered, if you wish, from minus 3 to infinity. OK? And the question is, find first alpha, then beta, then gamma, then c0, then c1. Of course, not all of them, but let's say the first 10, or sometimes I can get the first 50, if I have enough numbers here and enough precision, uh, to high precision, and find them quickly. Quickly means not just that the method is fast. The method is always very fast, but that you don't need a lot of an. So the ans may be very slow to compute. In the work I did with Garofalidis that I lectured about last year, we had a case where we could get up to n equals 67 with like a day of, or two of computer time. We could have gone up to 75. But they were very expensive to compute. So once you have them, the, the algorithm will be very quick. That's not the point. But you have to assume. So when I say quickly, what I mean is in the sense, and quickly. Quickly means quickly in the number of a's that you need. So you want to use a small number of coefficients and nevertheless have very high confidence and get these numbers. And remember, it's not obvious, because let's say I just have this. So if I have 100 numbers, and I just say, well, it looks like the limit is 1.3, you just draw a graph, then you're just estimating this sum by c0. But the error is 1 over 100, so you're off by 2%. I want the number to 30 digits. So the question is, how do you really pin it down? So if I leave you to think about it, many of you would, would find the answer. It's not really hard to do this. You just have to think of a way that's really easy to, to think through of an algorithm. And I'll come to it afterwards. You'll see it's very easy. But what I decided to do in the actual lecture is to start with many examples. I have like four or five prepared, and I have like 50 others that I could have given. I just made a selection, all from my own work, so just things that came up in various things, but I mean, my own work. Some were other people's papers, but they asked me, can you find the asymptotics? So things that I was confronted with, and they come from combinatorics, algebraic geometry, geometry, they can come from anywhere, it's just numbers. As I said, this is a situation you see all the time. You find some numbers, just a sequence of numbers maybe, even integers, and they're growing very quickly. You would like to know exactly how quickly they're growing, and not something vague, like it's roughly between n to the 4 and n to the 5. I would like it's n to the 4.229, blah, blah, times something, you know, in the exact asymptotics. And surprisingly enough, it's extremely easy. 
OK, so example one. Uh, so that Vd, this is meant to be some kind of a script d, d is an integer, is the vector space of Vasilyev not invariants. And I don't remember what it's called the degree at the end, it's called the degree not invariants of degree d. So d is some integer, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, if you don't know what a Vasilyev not invariant is, just to you know, to make my constants, put my constants at rest, I'll tell you very briefly, it's completely irrelevant. There are just some numbers, and I'll give it. We're going to bound them in terms of some other numbers that somebody else proved, Stoymanov, and those other numbers I will define. But this is the motivation. So let me tell you very briefly, Vas uh, uh, Vasilyev, maybe 30 years ago, I don't remember how long ago, discovered a very nice type of knot invariant, of which a couple of the known knot invariants uh, the Alexander Polyno, I forget what were, were examples. And the idea is, if you have a knot, you can always draw a knot by making a picture in the plane with crossings, and then each crossing, it either goes over, it goes under. So you take a plane, generic plane projection, and here would be a typical case. Well, this would be a kind of really stupid one, because it's uh, only a three crossings, so it can't even be alternating. This is probably... No, maybe that's the trefoil knot. I'm not even sure. But the first interesting one, same with an eight. I can't draw it anymore. I used to know how to draw this by, by heart, and now you make alternate crossings. It doesn't matter at all. Anyway, you have a knot. Now, if I have a knot invariant, then it'll associate to any knot a number, so invariant of k. So knot invariant is something you've invented that is well-defined. So by definition, when you draw a knot, you can simplify that knot. You can do so-called Rademeister moves and then compute this invariant. So let's say that this invariant had the property that if you have locally in your picture a crossing this way and you replace it by crossing the other way, then it doesn't change. Well, that would be a really stupid invariant because you could immediately unknot your knot. You just pull. And so that would be the constant. So that's d equals 0. But what if it does change, but the difference between the so the invariant of this minus the invariant where you change one cross into the other, let's call that I1 of the knot. Of course, it depends where you do this. And now you can do it again. You take I1 and you make another difference. And now let's assume that that's now zero. Then the original one wasn't necessarily zero, and so that's a bigger vector space. But you can easily see it's finite dimensional. So don't worry. So the number of times that you have to do this difference before you kill the invariant is called the degree. And if you fix the degree, it's a finite dimensional vector space. And then VB, well, we want to know the dimension, and we want to know what it is. So there are four bounds that I know. Well, the work I did is 20 years ago, and for all I know, there are, there are many new bounds. But I'm talking about the, this method, and that was this work of some number of years ago that I've forgotten. So the first thing is you have VD. This was, I don't even know who proved it. It's less than the number of linear chord diagrams of size D. So a linear chord diagram uh, let's say D is well, uh, I don't have to say D is 4, I can say D is anything. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you, may, you, you put 2D points on the real axis, and you number them 1 up to 2D, and then you connect them in pairs by semicircles. The size of the semicircle doesn't matter at all. It's just such a picture, and we have to know how many ways are there of connecting. Okay? So they correspond. I mean, you do things with that picture, but I won't. So this corresponds to elements in the symmetric group on 2D points, which is a free involution. So in other words, each I has a partner, which is then called tau of i. And of course, the partner of, of tau of i is i. So tau squared is identity, no fixed points. So it's just free involutions. And the, it's what's known, actually, is, sorry, so it's, of course, that's true. But what it is, is the dimension of the space of linear core diagrams on 2D points. So this is somebody's theorem, which I've, I should have looked up, but I've forgotten. Modulo a relation called the four-term relation. So there's a specific relation that if you have four different of these chord diagrams related in some simple way, crossing and uncrossing, A, B, C, and D, 
then A minus B plus C minus C is zero in this group, and you divide by that, and you get a vector space. So that immediately gives, sorry, this is equal, in fact, even without the dimensions. This is a theorem. VD can be written as the vector space of linear core diagrams, multilayer relation called the linear relation called the four term relation. So that immediately shows that dip domain VD is less than or equal to the number of free involutions with no restriction. So if free involution means there are no fixed points and it's an involution. So it's a product of two cycles. And this number is, of course, trivial to compute and very well known. It's 2 to the d times d factorial, which you can also write as 2d minus 1 double factorial. And the ob reason is obvious. You start with this point. You have to connect it to a point which is not itself. So there are 2d minus 1. Once you've chosen that, you take the next point. There are 2d minus 3 possible partners. So it's just 2d minus 1 times 2d minus 3 down to a 3 times 1. So that's an immediate upper bound. And this number grows uh, roughly uh, like 2 to the d. Well, this is asymptotically equal by Stirling's formula uh, to 2 to the d d factorial over the square root of pi d. So it's roughly like d factorial, but it has this 2 to the d in it as well. OK, so that's the uh, trivial upper bound once you know this theorem. So this where, where that's the starting point. So this implies the first upper bound is, is the trivial one. Then I'll just give the names of the authors. Hutov and Dujin in 1994 proved that it's less than or equal to d minus 1 factorial. That's much better because we've gained a factor of 2 to the d. We still have the factorial. OK? Then, mm, I don't know how to pronounce that. My Vietnamese is uh, non-existent. Uh, and Stanford, if I can pronounce that, in 1999, uh, improved it not by very much, but a factor of roughly 2d. So that's not a huge improvement, but just to show that people took this problem very seriously, and those were improvements. But then, Stoymanov showed that it's less than or equal to number xi d, which I'll tell you in one second. So this was Stoymanov in actually 1998. So you could say, well, why isn't this stronger? Well, because xi d it wasn't known what the asymptotics was. So he showed it's less than the number xi d, which I'm about to show you. But he didn't know anything about the asymptotics. So, uh, so these results don't per se, neither one overtakes the other. And xi d, what he showed is that every so Stoyanov's theorem was that every linear core diagram is congruent, multi the, this four-term relation, which I haven't told you what it is, to a linear combination, LC is always linear combination, of regular core diagrams. For my lecture today, it makes absolutely no difference what the definition is, but I will tell you because it's fun. Uh, a regular core diagram there are two ways to say it. So tau is this free involution. Tau is regular if whenever, well, whenever tau reverses two points, so in other words, two adjacent points, so that means tau of i plus 1 is less than tau of i. They have to be different because it's, in, it's a permutation. I, I plus 1 is bigger than i. So if it reverses the order, then the chords starting at i and at i plus 1. So those two particular chords at i plus 1 cross or coincide. So you could have i and i plus 1. And it could be that i is joined to i plus 1. i plus 1 is joined to i. Then they also cross, so or coincide. And if I write that in formless, it says that if tau of i plus 1 is strictly less than tau of i, then tau of i plus 1 is less than or equal to i, which is, of course, less than i plus 1, which is, in turn, less than or equal to tau of i. So in other words, the original interval is inside the new interval. But you can easily say that, see that that's the same as that it doesn't cross. So those are called regular. As I said, the definition doesn't matter except for fun. But the point is, you get this upper bound. And he had an output. So this is the number of regular chord diagrams, regular linear chord diagrams. 
And he had an algorithm to compute it for any d, but it was a triple uh, loop. It was quite complicated. So if you write a computer program, it's roughly O of d cubed to do it for d. So it takes some time. And he obviously used a computer. He'd gone up to 30. So Stoymanov went up to uh, about d equal, I think d equals 30 exactly, and found, uh, this is on his own words from his paper, he found that this uh, psi d seems to be, but he didn't have the, the asymptotic method, so it was just, uh, 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 you know, just looking at eyeballing the numbers. He put his, so this is from his paper, something like d factorial over 1 and a half to the d. So that's a lot better because here we had d factorial times an exponential 2 to the d. Here we gained an exponential factor. Here we gained only a linear factor. But now we're gaining another factor, 1.5 to the d. So compared to the original number, we've gained a factor of 3 to the d. It's already good. But then uh, comes my, coca my hot chocolate story, which uh, I asked, I think, Emmanuel. And he said, this one I haven't yet told. I tell lots of anecdotes. I'm not sure if it was hot chocolate or, or cocoa. It's almost the same drink. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. So when, so I was studying some completely other sequence of numbers, which I'll define in a second. So I forget what year. I could look it up. I had some other numbers, some other sequence, com totally different definition. And so I want to know if the, you know, I, but, and I could compute. I had a much simpler description, so I knew 200 values. Well, actually, I can tell you the definition. This was in a paper on a crazy function invented by Konsevich. It's now called the konsevich sagir function because he invented it, showed it to me, and we played with it for an hour, and that's all he did with it. Well, he, he had done some numerical computations, and I worked on it for several months, found the thing I'm about to show, connects with multiple forms, so that there's a paper written by me, but he invented the function, except it turned out he didn't invent the function. I was told later by several different topologists this was a known function. It was the uh, Kashaif invariant of the trefoil knob, which is this very simple knob I drew first. And his function was the function, the variable is q, and it's a very crazy function because it makes no sense anywhere. You take the infinite sum from 0 to infinity of the product, 1 minus q, 1 minus q squared up to 1 minus q to the n. That's called the nth Pochhammer sim, or q factorial. Now, if q is bigger than 1 in absolute value, then the nth term goes rapidly to infinity in absolute value. So it certainly diverges. But if q is less than 1 in absolute value, then the nth term has a limit, which is the infinite product. And it's a non-zero limit. So the, terms, the series still diverges. And if q is on the unit circle, then it oscillates all over the place. So this essentially never diverges, but it does sometimes converge. So this converges if q is equal to a root of unity. For instance, if q is i, then as soon as this n is bigger than 4, one of the factors is 1 minus q to the fourth, and it's zero. So the series terminates, and you get an algebraic integer. However, it also converges somewhere else. This is an example of what's called the Habiro ring, which is a wonderful ring. I won't talk about it in this course. This also converges not just at roots of unity, but infinitesimally near, near roots of unity. So let me write q as 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is infinitesimal. You might say there aren't any infinitesimal numbers, but epsilon is a formal variable. Well, now you see that this, this thing is a power series in epsilon, which is divisible by epsilon. Well, it is epsilon. It's a polynomial. This is a polynomial in epsilon divisible by epsilon. So is this. So the whole thing is a polynomial, hence a power series, divisible by epsilon to the n. So now we're in the epsilon adic topology. And of course, any power series whose nth coefficient starts with epsilon to the n is a well-defined power series, because each coefficient is just a finite sum. So therefore, you can expand this as the sum of some numbers. And to fit with what I said at the beginning, let's call this a n, or a d, I could call it a n epsilon to the n. That makes perfectly good sense. And I can even give you a little table. But if you're taking notes, keep a little space, because I'll have a second table a bit later. Well, n could also be called d, but I can say n. So uh, actually, this is 0 that we don't really care about very much. 1, 1, 2, 5. No, it's, we care for my story. 
the story won't work without the zero. So you can see these numbers are growing quite a bit. And I can already let the cat out of the bag, but I'm sure you guessed that the story is going to be that Stoymanov's psi d, which is his upper bound on the Vasilyev invariant, was mine. But how did I find that? I'd never heard of Stoymanov. I'd heard of Vasilyev invariants. I didn't know any of these bounds. So if you have a sequence of numbers and you want to recognize them, I like to joke there are two algorithms. One is you look it up in Sloan's, it used to be a book. Uh, so it was called the Handbook of Integer Sequences. It was a wonderful book. It was in every library, and I used it was many years ago. But of course, for many years now, it's, it's also online. And so you just go to the online version. So it's now the online Handbook of Integer Sequences. And you type in your, the beginning of your sequence, and the, it immediately tells you this is a known sequence. At least we have one that starts that way. And, this, and it gives you references, the definition, what is known about it. It's very, very good to identify. To finish that part of the joke, there are two algorithms. One is that, and the other is ask me. Because quite often, I either already recognize that I can figure out something because I love numbers. And there are other, I'm not the only person, but I'm the only person I know who loves sequence of numbers as much as I do. So uh, in this case, I couldn't ask myself because I was me. So I went to the handbook of integer sequence. I typed, you know, 1, 1, 2, 5, 15, 53. And the computer immediately said, sorry, it's not on our database. We don't have this sequence. Well, there was no reason they should. Nobody, as far as I know, had ever looked at this thing. So I, that was all. But then the next day, I got an email from Neil Sloan, from the author of this, who happens to be a, not a close friend of mine. I haven't seen him in many years, but a friend. And he wrote a very nice email. I still remember. He said, Dear Don, late at night, if I cannot fall asleep, I sometimes get up and make myself a cup of hot chocolate. Or maybe it was a cup of hot cocoa. But sometimes I get up and go to the computer and see who has been using my handbook. So last night, I looked at the computer, and I saw that you had looked up the sequence. And as I say, he knew me. So he said, but you obviously didn't know. I had typed 112515. He said, the, pro the computer program has been told to ignore. It leaves away trailing ones because there's no point, which is actually idiotic. It means if you put in the most famous sequence in mathematics, the Fibonacci numbers, 11235, it will say unknown sequence. But I told him, by the way, this is idiotic. Surely you can tell your computer if somebody types in a sequence to remove any unnecessary ones, and immediately did. So now you can put in Fibonacci. So he said, so you, that's why it didn't work. So I typed in your sequence again, 125515, one, without this font. And he said, here it is. So it's number so-and-so. And he said, I assume it's the same definition you had. But it wasn't at all that led to a research paper, because then I found Stoymanov. This whole story, he had computed the first 30. I get 200, because this thing is very easy to compute. And you could compute uh, easily a, a thousand or a few thousand if you wanted. And then, OK, so that's the story of the, of the hot cocoa. But then the question was, how do these numbers actually grow? And it was actually for this paper that I, I, I worked out the number, because the method that I, I didn't know. As I said, it's definitely known, but I've never seen it in this form. So I found numerically, I and mean, you can see just by looking at this table that they're going quite, quite fast. It's already 1,014 for n equals second. Numerically, I found, indeed, it was n factorial, as we already knew, because remember, these upper bounds were n factorial times a, an exponential. And Stoymanov said, roughly, well, his d is my n, n factorial over something. The number in the denominator had a well-defined limit. That's just like what I told you before, n factorial to a certain power, which here is 1. Then some purely exponential thing, like his guess, 1.5 to the d. Well, this number was 1.64.9 dot, dot, dot uh, to the n. But essentially, any number theorist would recognize that as 8 of 2, which is pi squared over 6. Uh, according to Euler, and indeed that's how Euler found that is by recognizing 1.6449 as pi squared over 6. So you see it's already a much better bound than the 1.5 to the d because 1.6 is bigger. But then uh, you can continue. Then if you divide by that, there's still a square root of n, which makes it a little worse, which is why his number was smaller than 1.6. Remember, his n was only 30. So the difference between 1.6 to the 30 and 1.5 to the 30 isn't huge. It's no bigger than 5, which is square root of n. So of course, if you had 1,000 numbers, you can distinguish them easily. But they were expensive. For him, even very expensive. For me, less expensive. But then comes the point that it's easy to recognize. But the other numbers, I could only get with this numerical procedure. 
and this I actually told in the opening lecture, so I've ruined the surprise, but I'll write it again. The first number, C0, to high precision, So however many digits that is, I think uh, uh, 19. So 19 digits, it, it was supposed to be that. And the next one's in the nature of the method. You lose precision as you go up. You could get more here by taking more terms. But I was using only 200 terms. And I also didn't know the method as well as I know it today. I think now I could get many more digits with the same 200 terms. These were the first three, but purely numerically. So the fact that they exist and have very well-defined values also confirms your guess. After all, we don't have a proof at all yet that this has any asymptotic expansion. But the fact that if it does have one, you get very well-defined numbers makes you think it's true. And in many problems like this, you have no idea, even when you've done the numerical analysis, whether it's true. But if the numbers converge to very high precision, you're fairly sure. But then, you know, after I studied the, the numbers, as I said, for uh, many weeks and finally wrote a paper that related to the multiple forms, it turned out that I could give a closed form for C0 and in particular, for, in principle, for any coefficient, but I think they got so complicated, I, I don't think I got even C1. And I think I maybe even wrote this number in the opening lecture. C0 is exactly 12, I mean, that's a theorem, 12 squared, so it's a theorem that there is such an expansion, first of all, with say of 2, and the C0 is 12 squared of 3 over pi to the 5 halves times e to the pi squared over 12. And when you now calculate that number on the computer, you find that all 19 digits are correct. So in other words, the asymptotic method really works. That's the message I'm trying to say. And it's super easy to do. But let me actually tell you more about these numbers, because it's kind of very pretty mathematics anyway. Some that I told in my course last year, because this is a Kashaif invariant. And that course was on not invariance and Kashaif invariance, not the Vasilev connection, but the Kashaif invariant. Uh, so the other definition with this shifted factorial. So here's another fact. If I, def if I take the same series, so I take the same series, 1 minus q times 1 minus q to the n. And then we see that what we did before was actually very unnatural mathematically. Because anybody who looks at that says, wait a second, the limiting value of, of this sum, and I already said that if q is less than 1 in absolute value, the limiting value of this is the infinite product. And that infinite product, we all know, is the dedicate eta function, except for two things. First of all, it's, it's off by a factor 1 over 24. So one should put in the 1 over 24 so that the limiting value is truly multiple. It'll have much better behavior. And secondly, q is not an independent variable. It's e to the 2 pi i tau. So if I'm on the imaginary axis, it would be e to the minus 2 pi tau, but I can just call e to the minus 2 pi t. I can rescale. So we don't want to, so not instead of 1 minus epsilon. So it's the same thing. If I substitute q is e to the minus t, this is no longer a polynomial t, but it's a power c. It's divisible by t. That's, they're all divisible by t. There are n of them. The n theorem is divisible. So this converges. And then these were, uh, now I can illustrate my story before that there are two methods. You find that you get some integers, uh, tn up to a factor 24 to the n. And here are the tn. They grow a lot faster, 1, 23, 16, 81, 2, 5, 7, 5, 4, 3. I'll only give one more. I only wrote one more down, and they're huge. 3, 7, 2, 8, 1. So now these mathematically are much more natural, because we're taking the right variable, t, t which is essentially tau in the upper half plane, and we've included the q to the 1, 24. Now again, there are two methods. You can ask me, well, on this, I'm proud to say I didn't look it up in Sloan's handbook of sequences. I thought about it, and I, I found the answer by myself. And then I looked it up in Sloan's handbook of sequences, and of course, it was there. And they're called the Glacier's T numbers. And they were already found, I think, Glacier was 1903, so well before me. But, uh, but you could find them. And they're defined by the very, so you again, you always remember any series of numbers you use a generating function. But a generating function, there are many kinds. We could have just tn x to the n, or we could divide by n factorial. But we might want to divide, make an odd series, and then again make it exponential. Now, these numbers grew so, big, so fast that this diverges. But this one now converges. So it's an actual function. And it's a very nice function. It's sine of 2t divided by 2 cosine of 3t. So that's the definition of the glacier numbers. And so that gives you, they're, they're listed. 
there. These are the glaciers T numbers. And that's the definition. They're defined by a generating function. And we take the same generating function with a different factorial. And then you get something completely different. Now, from that, you get a closed formula, which I'll also give. Because in the first lectures of this course, I explained about asymptotics and values of L series at negative interest and about Bernoulli polynomials. And this is a bit of all of them. Let me put L12 of n is the Dirichlet series 12 over n, n to the minus s. So if you don't know what 12 over n is, I can tell you the first few values. It's 0 if n has a factor in common with 12, so 2 or 3. So we start with 5, 7, 11. So the coefficients for 1, 5, 7, 11 are 1 plus minus minus plus, and then it repeats with period 12. OK, so that's the L series. And so Tn is equal exactly to two, Tn plus 1 factorial over 2 squared of 3 times the L series, uh, this L series, at 2n plus 1 over pi over 6 to the 2n plus 1. So that gives you the exact asymptotics, because if n is large, then this is just 1 plus O of 1 over 5 to the n. So, it's x. so this is essentially 1. So this tells you the asymptotics. Of course, you can also write the functional equation, which I, I won't even write because I didn't write it down. You could also write it as some simple multiple, now rational, of the value of this L series at a negative number. But you can also write it by the method I explained in the first lecture of the course. So this is another nice application that you could write any Dirichlet series if chi is periodic in terms of Bernoulli numbers, of Bernoulli polynomials, with the denominator is that number. So here the denominator is at most a 12. Well, it's exactly a 12. In the exact formula for what it's worth, it's just a, up to a factor. It's just a difference of two Bernoulli polynomials. Well, the same Bernoulli polynomial evaluated at 12 and 5 plus. It should really be at a 12 minus, at 5 twelfths minus at 7 twelfths plus at 11 twelfths. But remember, the Bernoulli polynomials are, have a symmetry. So that thing would be 0 if the index were odd, and it has to be even, and then we only need two of the four terms by the symmetry. OK, so that's a very nice sequence of numbers, and that's my first story, including the hot chocolate story. So I'm purposely digressing, because that's the whole point of the course, is to tell lots of fun mathematics that in some way are related to asymptotics. It's not a concentrated course proving a bunch of theorems. So I won't even apologize for all the digressions. That's this kind of a course. OK, so that was my first example. And I hope it's a nice one with all of these surprises that it has this deep interpretation in terms of linear, regular linear core diagrams, but completely different in terms of the expansion of the so-called Otsuka expansion of a function of the Hadero ring. So it's, that's a class of a huge, uh, an example of a huge class of functions of very great interest in three-dimensional quantum topology that my whole course last year was about that some of you also heard. OK, well, at this rate, I won't even finish the second example, and I have four, and then I want to tell the actual method. But if I don't get to the method, I don't care, because then we have something for next time. We'll have something for next time anyway, I'm sure. But the method is fun, but the examples are somehow even more fun. And the less you know, the more fun it is. Because once you know, you say, sure, I could have done that too. But when you see this, well, certainly when I did this and found it, I was completely amazed that it was possible just out of 200 numbers to normally see the pi squared over 6, but get this number to all those digits. And then I thought, this can't be right. But when I finally, the, 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 the analysis uh, two or three months later gave the exact number, and it really was right. So I kind of fell in love with this, with this method, which, again, I emphasize is definitely not, I'm not presenting it as a new piece of mathematics. It's probably equivalent in some sense to Lagrange interpolation. Lagrange is a very long time ago. And it's almost certainly, these several friends have told me, equivalent to something called the Richardson interpolation method. When I looked that up in, in some physics book, the explanation was so hard for me, I couldn't quite figure out what it was. I'm sure one could. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure my friend was right and told me that it's equivalent. But the way I'll show you with the mnemonic makes it easy to recognize. So my second example is from algebraic geometry. Specifically, it's from a paper of two friends of mine, Daniel Grunberg and Peter Moray. Uh, I won't write it because what they did is not relevant. I'll write a definition. And this was a, these were numbers that had been studied for 50 years or something by people like van der Waarden. So let n is again the index. Let this be the number of lines 
So this is what's called enumerative geometry. It's a whole field of algebraic geometry. The most famous, well, the person who really started was Schubert, not the musician, and that's the famous Schubert calculus. And you do it in terms of term classes of various bundles on various uh, problems of Grassmannians and things like that. But it's to count some, some problem of algebraic geometry, how many objects of a certain sort are there. But you have to adjust all the dimensions so it's finite. If you know about multiply space, you want the virtual dimension, so multiply space to be zero, and then it's just a collection of points, and you want to know how many points. So here it's the number of uh, lines in a hypersurface. So here I'm not changing the degree. It's always lines. In some problems like this, you have things of degree n, but here it's degree 1. A hypersurface, of, in a hypersurface, generic maybe, of degree something in Pn. It doesn't matter, let's say, Pn of C. It doesn't matter. So in projector space. And here the degree has to be 2n minus 3. And that's to make the number finite, to make it interesting. So if, if the degree is, you know, is too big and too small in one direction, there will be generically none, and the other will be infinitely many. To get a finite number, you have to have zero-dimensional multiply space. And when you compute, it's this. So let's take two cases. Well, V1, even, I mean, I like to be very pedantic and very degenerate. Even I don't want to think about things of degree minus 1 in, a, in P1. One. I mean, these are lines in P1. P1 is already a line. So is that one line or is it not a line? Just the line of degree minus one. Let's just ignore it. But how about V2? If V2 is, this is degree one. So it's a straight line. And this is P2. Uh, sorry, something is wrong. Now something is really wrong. Oh, no, it's a hypersurface in Pn. So that's right. So before I had P1, but a hypersurface in P1 is a point. And the number of lines with any property in point is surely zero. But if you ask for lines with degree 2 minus, so I guess it's zero, but it, it's really kind of weird. But if I take two, a hypersurface in P2 of degree 1 is a hyperplane. But a hyperplane in P2 is a line. The number of lines in a line is 1. So this is trivial. V3, v now 2n minus 3 is 3. We're in P3, but we're in a hypersurface of degree 3. That's called a cubic hypersurface. So it's a cubic surface. The number of lines on a cubic surface is, th that's the most famous example of enumerative geometry that there is. There are 27 lines on a cubic surface. OK, so there's a formula that I'll write in a second, but let me give you a couple more numbers. So n and vn. Uh, so I already told you it starts 1. That wasn't very hard, 27. But they grow rather fast. The next one is 2,875. The next is 68,905. And the next, if I can read my handwriting, is 3,050,500. No, 30,509,306. So there's a formula. And I'll give you the formula just for fun. And even the slight improvement of the formula that I found, uh, which I was proud of, maybe it was known, maybe it wasn't, but for their paper. And then I found the asymptotics in the end theoretically, but first it was the asymptotic method. And these two authors, this was, to say, Daniel Grunberg and Peter Moret, who's still at the Max Planck Institute, and they liked it so much that they wrote, I wrote an appendix to prove the asymptotics of this sequence. They wrote an appendix explaining my method. They said, Don's you know, asymptotics trick. So that's one place where it's written down because they thought it was a lot of fun. But in fact, we didn't use it here because you could prove it in this case. So here is the, uh, the closed formula. So something that maybe, I don't know if anyone in this room has used this, maybe Pavel Putkov, but certainly Lothar Goethe would know it. Well, the idea plot localization formula uh, in some equivariant version, it implies after some work, so this was a known formula in the old literature, the following explicit formula. You sum over all pairs of integers, let's say i less than j between 0 and n inclusive, and then you take the product, a and b, I won't write that they're non-negative, I'll just put a plus b is this degree that we want 2n minus 3. So a goes from 0 to 2n minus 3, and b is the complementary number. And you take a times some free variable wi plus b times wj. So that's a linear form in n plus 1 in n variables, n, n plus 1 variables. 
So we have a, a, a product of linear forms. So it's a, it's a form of degree 2n minus 2. And then we divide by the product. Uh, k again goes from 0 to n. It's different from i and j, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. wi minus wk times wj minus wk. OK, so that's a much bigger degree. Now, that's the answer. And the crazy thing about this answer, so the, the a and the b are very, I mean, they're in summation. But w and i, and so this is the answer. And surprisingly, you can't see this. I look at this formula. This is independent of these n plus 1 complex numbers, which is certainly not obvious at all. So if you write down this expression in a bunch of variables, it's simply a constant. It only depends on n. And for small n, it's given by that table. So they showed me this. That formula was known. And first, I, I found a much more elementary proof of the fact that it's constant. And that then gave a closed formula, which is very much easier to work with, which I have here. It's the coefficient of x to the n minus 1 in 1 minus x times the product. And again, a and b in non-negative and with some 2n minus 3 and you take a plus bx. That's a much simpler formula. And that's obviously, just, I mean, there aren't any parameters. That's just you expand and you get some, some input. OK, so those are the first values. And now the method here, if you apply the method using this formula, it's very easy to compute, say in Paris. The other would be very unpleasant. Well, you could just take some random numbers, like 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n, I guess, and just do it. But anyway, this is extremely easy. So you can compute a bunch of numbers. And if you do that, you will find this is now anticlimactic because you'll find something in the form I'm talking about. It doesn't really matter what it is. But just for completeness, I'll say what it is. It's the square of 27 over pi. It's again growing like n to the 2n. But because the natural parameter is really 2n, here it's natural to do it as a power of 2n minus 3. And then the power is 2n minus 7 halves. And then you get a power series which starts 20, square root of 27 over pi, but all the coefficients contain the square root of 27 over pi, so I took it out because then they're now rational, and it starts 9 over 8n uh, minus 111 over 640n squared. It's nice numbers, 9, 11, and 9, 9, 9, 9. It's like calling the police uh, over 25600 n cubed and so on. So there is an asymptotic expansion. You can find it very easily using the trick once I've shown you the trick. And you, the only problem when you do it is recognizing this number, because this number will be 1.125000. Anybody can recognize it. And once you know it's rational, you, you either just multiply by something small, or you use continued fractions, and you find immediately. So these are very easy. This what happens to be easy, because you might think of squaring. Maybe you think of Alpine by Chi. In practice, recognizing a number like this is already not so easy. And actually, nobody really knows how to do it unless you have a guess. If you think it might be, say, the square root of an integer over some power of pi, integral or half integral, times e to some rational multiple of pi squared, then it's very easy. But if you don't have any idea what it is, you know, I'll just give it to you decimally, it would be very hard to guess. So in a number as simple as square root of 27 over pi, believe me, you can easily recognize. So even if you didn't know, but in this case, you can prove it theoretically using these formulas. But that, that was a nice example where this got used very early, very uh, early for me. I mean, so it was one of the first problems. I, maybe I'll leave that and re remove this part. So then the next example is an infinite collection of examples. So example three, let's have some numbers bn, let's say in r, again known explicitly, and we uh, decaying in some way. And we take my sum, I want to compute the infinite sum. This is certainly a problem you have a lot in mathematics. You have an infinite sum, and you want to compute its value numerically to high precision, after which, if you're lucky, you might be able to recognize it exactly like one could do here with this formula. You might not, but at least you'll have 20 digits. And of course, it should be fairly slowly converged, or it's no fun. If it converges like 1 over n factorial, you just take 15 or 20 terms, and you already have 20 digits. But it converges like 1 over n squared, and you want 100 digits. Then you need 10 to 100 terms, and no computer will do that. So 
that's the question. Well, now it's kind of clear what you have to do. You take a n, let's call it a capital N, to be the partial sum. And so this will be maybe, if this is nicely behaved, c0 plus c1 over n plus dot, dot, dot. And you use the asymptotic series, so using the, the uh, general problem, so the, the, the asymptotic trick, I'll call it, because that's what Grimberg and Moray called it, the asymptotic trick, what you'll get is the limiting value, which is what you want. The infinite value of the sum is, of course, just c0 to as many digits as you want. You now don't care about the, the way it converts. You only care about c0. OK? So an example of the velocity, that's a whole class of examples. It's any convergence sum. It won't always work. So let me make a couple of comments about that. First, I'll give an example. I think I'll erase all of this. Example two is finished. So an example of the other, of, of this in practice, well, uh, so this is EG. And the example I'm going to give you, it's actually a little trickier. It's not quite like that. And yet the method applies very beautifully. So the example, uh, which I gave as one of my three examples on the course announcement, which is you know, on the wall here at the ICTP as uh, advertising for the course. So this is a problem in a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, asked me about a year ago. He had some reason to think that the infinite sum had a certain value, just because he computed a lot of terms. It didn't have that value at all. But anyway, he asked me if I could compute the following sum. So this is written in, in the poster, so you've already seen it if you looked at that. Take the binomial coefficient j plus 4 thirds over j. I assume you all know that the binomial coefficient is defined even if it's not two integers. If the number below is an integer, it's just a polynomial in the upper variable. You can take anything. Now, that wouldn't converge, because this grows roughly like j to the 4 thirds. So it's growing. Even if I took the inverse, it would be like 1 over j to the 4 thirds. Well, actually, that would converge, but just barely. But the one he needed was the minus 4 thirds power of this. Don't ask me why. Actually, I never asked him why. And so this converges. It converges like. Uh, j to the minus 16 over 9, well, like the sum of that. 16 over 9 is bigger than 1, so it does converge, but it's less than 2. So it's even worse than the sum 1 over n squared, but the error after n terms would be O of 1 over n. Here, the error after n terms would be n to the 7 ninths. So even if n is 1,000, you take 1,000 terms, you'd only have you know, two digits or something. So the question is, what is this number? And I can uh, already tell you if I find in my notes what the number is. So it is, in fact, uh, 2.075467266591, dot, dot, dot. So in the course announcement, the exercise was compute this number with a reasonable number of terms of the series, not too many terms, to, let's say, 250 digits, just of a benchmark. Of course, I could ask for 100 or 500. So my, my friend did it by using Mathematica, which is a mistake anyway, but by brute force. I did this today, but I forgot to write down the answer. So I'm sorry. If you just take the first 30,000 terms, then, oh, and I didn't even write down the timing. I especially ran it on my computer, even in Paris, which is faster than Mathematica, and forgot to write down. But I remember it finished, so it was, let's say, five minutes. I don't know. So if you just do the sum, then you'll get s plus roughly I don't remember exactly, but of the order of 10 to the minus 4. And you can do it easily from the, remember the error is n to the minus 7 ninths. So it's in the 30,000 to the 7 ninths is maybe 1,000. So you'll get maybe even three digits. So, and the three were, were very close to a particular number. And so my friend asked me, is it that number? Well, it wasn't at all once you have more digits. So the question is, can you do it? Now, somebody who uh, is in the course but is not here now because he's away, came to you a few days ago and he said, you know, you asked that as an exercise. I said, it wasn't meant as an exercise, it was meant as advertising. But he had done the exercise and did use Mathematica and he got the 250 digits I asked, considerably more slowly than this, but still it was like you know, half an hour or something. I mean, this thing is, I'll tell you in a second, I get 250 digits in the 20th of a second using only, I think, two or 300 values. He used, but he didn't use 30,000 30, values. But he used Euler McLaurin, and he thought it's a nice application. So let me say a word about that. If, which is not quite the case here, but it's very close, 
if the number is what I call the Vn itself has, let's say it has the asymptotic well, it should converge, uh, it should converge, so let's say it's, you know, uh, a over n squared or alpha over n squared plus beta over n cubed well, e2, e3, and e4 over n to the fourth plus o of 1 over n to the fifth. Then what you can always do on the computer is compute up to n. You just take the first n terms. n is, let's say, 500 or 300. And then if you compute bn, well, of course, it'll be exactly e2 times the sum 1 over n squared plus e3 uh, sum from 1 to n, and then here the sum from 1 to n, 1 over n cubed, and then the sum 1 over n to the fourth, and then plus the sum from 1 to n of the difference, bn minus e1 over n squared minus e2 minus e3 over n squared minus e4 of, I'm sorry, this is illegible, you just subtract it. Now, this one you can do by Euler Maclaurin. So any number of terms, this is a constant, which happens to be pi squared over 6, minus a power series of 1 over n. You can have as many terms as you want. Similarly, this is zeta of 3 minus as many terms as you want. This, all of those, you know, they're complete asymptotics. And then the last one, since I've subtracted the terms 1 over n squared, 3 and 4, it's O of 1 over n to the fifth. The sum of that from 1 to n to infinity is 1 over n to the fourth. So you will get it up to n to the fourth, which means even if n is 300, you're doing a lot better than 1 over n. The problem is to do that, you have to know what are e2, e3, and e4. So how do you find their astrototics? Well, if it's a simple form, then here it is. It's in, in this case, by the way, these numbers, so in general, it'd be e lambda over n to the lambda. And here, remember, our thing actually started 16 nines, 16 nines plus 1. So here it's shifted. So it's, but it, all the McLaurin, remember, works there equally well, as I explained. So here, it's easy to give the asymptotic expansion of this. And now if you use all McLaurin for each piece and subtract them out, that's what he did. It was very good thinking. Uh, but, but in order to, th you have to get these coefficients. And here, you can just get it from the from Stirling's formula. But if you have numbers like the Vasilia, if you have no idea what the numbers themselves are. And so to find the asymptotics of this, you have to apply the asymptotics trick to the individual terms. But to each one, because once you get to the first one, I mean, you have to get all of these. But then why do that? Why not just apply to the sum right away? So, so that's why this method, although it's, uh, it, it doesn't give more than Ola McLaurin in favorable cases, namely when Ola McLaurin applies, it often applies when it doesn't. But even when it does, it's much easier because for Ola McLaurin, you have to do it twice, and you only do it once. So now, I actually haven't used up my time, so I want to now go back to the general problem, and as I said, I want to both specialize it and generalize it, and then solve it. And I think I can do that in the remaining time. And the next time, I'll talk about more applications of a more general problem. So here's a special problem, which is a special case. So given a, 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 a n uh, in the same sense as before, so you know, the question is also, what does given mean? Like, you know, what is the word is? in the same sense as before, which remember means that you can compute any given n in a reasonable amount of time if n is not too big. You can compute for n is 100 or n is maybe 1,000 in a minute or an hour or whatever you want to spend, but not in the lifetime of the universe. But very important, you can compute to arbitrary precision. In some of my examples, these numbers, in most of my examples, these numbers were integers. So there was no question of precision. If I had the first 300, they were integers. There was no loss of precision. But sometimes they're real numbers. And then you have to compute them accurately, because the method, although it's very quickly convergent, will magnify any uh, instabilities. It's a very unstable method in that sense. So you do need high accuracy. So for instance, for the problem I just wrote down that I stupidly erased, oh, I didn't even finish the problem. So this problem, remember, it was j plus 4 over 3 to the over j, the minus 4 thirds. So brute force with the sum up to 30,000 gives you about an error of about three digits. Uh, the method uh, with a sum of just 300 gives you more than 250 digits. I'm usually I would stop at a rounder number like 250, but then I was just under 250, and that's what I put on the poster. So, and by the way, this takes, even in Paris, uh, many minutes, maybe 10 minutes. I mean, not, uh, you know, not hours, but it, 
it takes some time because it, it takes a certain amount of time to compute with even the binomial coefficient to the minus fourth. It's kind of horrible numbers. But this one took zero point, less than 0 0.05 seconds in Paris. So it took me a little more than that to write the program because the program is three lines, and so that took probably five minutes to write, write the program. But it ran in 0 0.05. And if you needed 3,000 digits, it would take longer but a few seconds. So the method really works. As I said, this is kind of a stupid case of the method because, as that person pointed out to me, you could just use Euler McLaurin here because you know the asymptotics of this thing by Stirling's form. But in most cases that we had, we had no idea of, you know, how these numbers grew. It was just a sequence of numbers. So this was the general method, and I want to say the, the simpler problem. Well, I can call it the simpler problem. It's simpler and, of course, more special. Huh? But it's... Now it's bounded, or they're bounded. Uh, they look bounded. You compute, again, a few hundred. Like here, these xi n's certainly don't look bounded. If you look at this sequence 1125 up to 1014, of course, you can't prove they're not bounded. Maybe they never exceed a million, but it sure as hell looks like they're growing even fast. So they look bounded. And you want, and you want the limit. That was like we had when we let the infinite sum. You want the limit. Oh, I changed notation. That was capital A. No, here it was little a. And then I'll go back to little a. I kind of prefer capital A. But now you want the limit A infinity. And often that's all you want, like in this thing. I just wanted the infinite sum. I didn't care how fast it converges once I got it. So specifically, that means that the ansatz here, so your assumption, working assumption, is that A n looks like simply C0 plus C1 over n plus c2 over n squared. So it's, it's the same assumption as before, but now we're assuming that alpha, beta, and gamma are zero. And I, so I'm assuming less, and I want less. So it's easier on both sides. We want only c0. So I'm not asking anymore for c1, c2, and all the others, just the limit. OK? So that's, but to high precision. We do want it, I think, uh, not exactly, but to high precision, to whatever precision you need. And of course, quickly. So quickly means that the algorithm itself shouldn't be complicated. It's super easy, but that you don't need too many terms. Like in my example, we needed 300 terms instead of 30,000 to get you know, 250 digits instead of three. So we want very high precision with a small number of terms as input. And of course, you can't put in three terms or five, as I said. You can't expect to do asymptotics with three numbers. You need, uh, you know, of the order of 50 or 100, is sort of the least to make it work. So. Before I explain how to do that, so that's a simpler problem, let me show how to reduce. That's very simple. Reduction of the general problem. To the simpler problem. So I'll do it in four steps. First of all, if alpha equals beta equals gamma equals zero, of course, we don't know what they are. But let's imagine that in this ansatz that I didn't have the factorial growth, the Schaeffre class. I didn't have exponential growth, and I didn't have power growth. So I've simply a n is equal to c0 plus c1. Well, that's an ansatz. That's what we expect. And you want to find all. But remember, we're doing the more complicated, the general problem. So even though alpha, beta, and gamma are zero, we're now asking for c0, c1, c2 for all of them. But then it's very easy because the simpler algorithm gives me C0 to high precision. That's exactly what it does. So now I define, it's pretty obvious, A and star to be N. I just subtract C0 from the nth term in my list. I have a list of 200 numbers. I subtract that constant from all of them and multiply by N. Well, now that's supposed to be C1 over N plus C2 over N squared it's, uh, sorry, C1 now plus C2 over N plus dot, dot, dot. And so the simple now gives me C1 because I have a method that exactly applies to that problem. And now it's pretty clear. I do the next stage, which is that I take An star minus C1, which is the same as the original An minus the first two terms of its expansion. And you multiply by N squared. And then that's C2 plus dot, dot, dot. And that will give me C2, et cetera. And I do it as many times. Now, if I do it 100 times, I'll start getting complete nonsense. If I only have 100 coefficients at the beginning, it won't work. If I had 1,000 co I have done one case 
where I got more than 200 terms of the expansion. And later, there was an exact form, but they were rational numbers. And all 200 were correct. By the way, you know they're correct when you find them. How would you know that a sequence of rational numbers is correct? If you aren't used to working with numbers, you'd say, how do you know? I, mean, how do you, I have a sequence of numbers. They come out of the computer. How do you know that they're correct? It's very easy. Any sequence of rational numbers that comes up in life, in real practice, has denominators that are highly factored and grow slowly. Because however they come, you're adding and multiplying simple things. And so the denominator will only have small prime factors. Maybe it uh, divides 2n factorial or something like that, or 2n factorial squared. But your computer doesn't know that. So when you compute the 100th coefficient and you approximate it, you get it as a real number to 100 digits. You use continued fractions, write it as a quotient of two integers. And now you factor the denominator. In fact, he does immediately. Of course, if they're huge prime factors, it won't. But if, if this will have small. And then you find it's 2 to the 135 times 3 to the 87 times 5 to the something. That can't be random. It's 100% convincing. If the denominators are very highly factored and, and don't have any large prime factors, then you're OK. And, if they, and you see it when you do run the computer program. At a certain point, suddenly there's a big prime factor. And you stop and either give up or you go back with more numbers, more precision, and, and you redo it. So in practice, you always know. So this is the first case. If we are in the simple case that we have simply a bounded sequence, so there's no factorial growth, no exponential growth, no polynomial growth, but there is a power series and you want them all, the simple method gives you C0, but then you just subtract and multiply by n and repeat. That's pretty obvious. Actually, all, all, everything I'm saying now is completely obvious. The only thing that's fun is the solution to the simple problem. But let me finish the reduction. So the next case is alpha equals beta equals 0. So now an is equal, well, this is an ansatz, but we're assuming it's a power of n times c n0 plus c1 over n plus 1. But you have these numbers, let's say, the first 200. Well, now I make a new sequence that I have numerically. I just divide a n by a n minus 1. I mean, if there's no a0, we only care about n bigger than 5 or something. We're interested in the asymptotics. Well, if I divide a n by n minus 1, then, of course, n to the gamma over n minus 1 to the gamma will be 1 minus 1 over n to the gamma times c0 plus c1 over n and so on over c0 plus c1 over n minus 1 and so on. So that will start 1 minus gamma over n. And so then, if we already use the previous one, that we get gamma. And if you want the next term, it's not very hard. Uh, if you expand this by the binomial theorem, the next coefficient will be gamma times gamma plus 1 over 2. And this part, the C zeros cancel, but you'll be left with minus C1 over C0. So if you want to use a bit more of that method, you can get gamma and C1 over C0, but it's silly. It's way too complicated. You get gamma by the previous method, because you subtract 1, multiply by n, take the limit by the simple problem. You get gamma, and then you take your new a n tilde, is simply a n, and you divide by n. Once you know gamma, then of course you're back to the previous case. So in each of these things, as you add one more the thing to the left. Once you found it, you just divide by the you're in the previous case. So the next case is when alpha is zero, that beta is anything. So now a n, the ansatz, is that it's beta to the n, so it's exponentially big. Well, now it's even easier, because again, I just take the quotient. The quotient of beta to the n by beta to the n minus 1 is simply beta times 1 minus gamma over n plus etc. And so the simple problem now, with no modification, gives you beta immediately. Take the limit. And then I can divide by beta, and now in the case when beta is zero, and then I divide by that, then alpha and beta are both zero, and I'm back to this. And finally, the most general case, you again take a n star to be a n over n minus 1. Well, n factorial over n minus 1 factorial is just n, so the gamma power of that is n to the gamma times beta times 1 minus gamma over n plus dot dot dot. And now, uh, by the previous, the one we already did, that was the case we already did. When there's a power but no factorial, this will give me gamma. Sorry, this was alpha. Excuse me. I always forget what I'm calling what. This will give me alpha to arbitrary precision. So that's how successively, uh, so in practice, of course, you don't start that way. You start the other way. You first take the quotient, and you find alpha. Then you divide by n factorial to the alpha. Then you, in this case, take the quotient and find beta. Then you divide by beta to the n, take the quotient and find gamma. And then you divide by n to the gamma, and you have the power series, and you find the limit, and you subtract the limit. So it's kind of clear that we only have to solve this simpler sounding problem where you simply have a single power series uh, 
as an ansatz for the nth coefficient, you have the nth number up to n is 200, and you want the limit numerically to high precision. Then you can get all of these other numbers. OK. So now I still have 14 minutes. See, that's the advantage of speaking so fast. I can say more. You can't understand, but I can say more. So I'm sorry. If I speak too fast, as I always do, you should stop me. If you don't stop me, I'll continue speaking too fast. So now at least we can give the, find me the method. Well, I think I told you the method on the first day because it's impossible to forget with this mnemonic. It's intentionally slightly provocative. It's not meant to be completely clear what I mean, but the method is you multiply by n to the eighth. So if some of you have seen this before, then you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, you, you, you can say, I don't know what he's talking about, but you have to admit it's simple. Multiplying by n to the eight is not very complicated. Okay? So what do we actually do? So we take a n, which remember, as an ansatz, I'm now assuming has a power series in one over n as its expansion. And at the risk of seeing pedantic, which I don't mind that risk because I am pedantic and always seem, I'm going to go all the way to the tenth coefficient. Okay. Now, you multiply by n to the eighth. Let's call that a n tilde, or star, or whatever you want. Star. Okay? So that, if our ansatz is correct, will be a polynomial of degree eight. Of course, eight is the number I chose. It, of course, doesn't have to be eight. You could take 11. But you can't take a million or, or one. I mean, you have to take something that has a little you know, pizzazz in it. So this is a polynomial of degree eight plus c9 over n, to the, over n to the one plus c10 over n squared and so on. So we now have a polynomial plus a power series of one over n. But the first non-trivial coefficient of the power series is c9, much further than we had originally. Now. If you have a sequence of numbers, any sequence, bn, let me define delta bn to be bn plus 1 minus bn. So the first difference, or if you prefer, bn minus bn minus 1. It makes no difference. It's the same sequence, just shifted by 1. And similarly, you can do it again. Delta squared of bn is delta delta bn. So if I do it upwards, it'll be bn plus 2 minus 2 bn plus 1 plus b. N. I mean, you've all seen this. It's just the alternating sum of bn, bn plus 1, up to bn plus whatever, uh, with the binomial coefficients as coefficients. By the way, when you do this on the computer, I'm not sure what's faster. But my program, I mean, the way I programmed this long ago, it's, it's uh, two lines. I just have a thing called diff of a sequence. And so diff of a sequence, I can even write the Paris program. You'll see it's not very hard. It's the sequence that's a vector of length the length of n, which is called number of v, or you can put length of v, minus 1. It's 1 shorter. It's indexed by n, and the nth coefficient is v of n plus 1 minus v of n. So that, in Paris, is the, def is the definition of the difference. And then I just, instead of working out the binomial coefficient, I'm going to do this eight times. I don't compute all the 8 over i, i from 0 to 8. It's not very hard, and Paris knows them by heart. But it takes a little time. I just take the difference. I, I do it again and again eight times. So now let me take a n, let's call it tilde, so I don't have too many stars. I'm going to take the eighth difference of a n star. But then I'll divide by 8 factorial. Now when you take the difference of a polynomial that starts c0 n to the 8th, to the leading order inside the derivative, it starts 8 n to the 7th. The next difference starts 8 times 7 n to the 6th. The eighth difference is 8 factorial times n to the 0. When you divide by 8 factorial, you'll get C0. But the eighth difference of a polynomial degree 7 is identically 0. Just like the first difference for constant is 0, the second difference for linear function is 0, and so on. So we now get a very nice expansion, C0 plus 0 over n plus 0 over n squared, all the way up to and including 0 over n to the 8, because the difference of a constant is 0. Now we come to C9. Well, when you take C9, you have to take the nth derivative. But as I told you, the nth derivative to leading order is the same as the, uh, the nth difference is the same as the nth derivative. So when I do this, the derivative of 1 over x to the 9 is 9 
over x to the 10. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, this is n over 1, so it's 1 over x. The derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared, then plus 2 factorial. When I do it 8 times, since 8 is even, I'll get plus 8 factorial over x to the 9th. And so this is exactly, if I divide by 8 factorial as I'm doing, it's exactly 1 over x to the 9th. So the next term will be cn over n to the 9th. And you see what I've done is it's exactly my original series. The c0 is still there, the c9 is still there, that I've killed. These are now all gone. These intermediate coefficients have simply left. Now, I, I don't like to be dishonest. I could have just written that. You would have already thought I'm a little nuts to write out nine terms after I write two. Surely you know how it goes on. But you see, I had a reason to put this. But I had a reason to write this here. I don't want to be dishonest. When you take the, nth, the eighth derivative of 1 over x squared, which remember is what we're doing in the next one, then you'll get 2 the first time times 3 up to, up to 9. So you'll get 9 factorial over x to the 10th, and 9 factorial over 8 factorial is 9. So the next term is not exactly what it was before. So you don't quite take the original series and just remove the intermediate terms. This gets multiplied by 9, the next by 9 times 10. But n is large. n is going to be 1,000 if we had 1,000 coefficients. So if n is 1,000, if I had 1,000 coefficients, then the error of simply the original sequence minus the limit will be O of 1 over n, which is therefore 10 to the minus 3. It is of the order of 10 to the minus 3. But this a n tilde minus a infinity, well, a infinity is c0. It's going to be O of 1 over n to the 9th, which is suddenly 10 to the minus 27. And now I don't really care about this because it's 10 to the 30 and 10 to the 33. The 9 isn't going to bother me. n is much bigger than that. Of course, it's diverged eventually, but we're where it's asymptotic series, we're truncating. So what you see is that by this completely trivial thing, and all I had to do was a single subtraction of the nth term minus n plus first, and I repeated that eight times. So that takes you know, milliseconds on the computer. And what I get, now I don't have to do any extrapolation. I just take a 1,000, as I already said, is c0 plus o of, uh, of 10 to the minus 27. And so I get 27 digits. And so what you do is you just print out the numbers, and you see that you know, 20, to 27 digits, they just converge, and you take those digits. And that's the whole method. And as I say, it's totally trivial to program in any programming language under the sun. It's, it's one line in Paris. Also now, I showed this to Henri Cohen, who's the originator of Paris many years ago, and he's now included it. Uh, so it, you can even just call it you know, extrapolation. But, uh, but it's incredibly useful because you keep, I gave you three or four different examples. Actually, since I still have six minutes, I quickly wrote down, just from my home page, several other things that I've encountered recently, if I didn't lose the page. So let me mention three other things that are fun, I mean, you know, interesting mathematics, completely different fields, where one had a sequence of numbers and where this could be used. All of them, I'm either the author or co-author. I think always a co-author of the paper because that's why I'm choosing those examples. So in a paper maybe 20 years ago, so an old paper before I knew the method, uh, with Ralf Kaufmann and Yuri Manin and myself. And this is on what are called, well, the title is Higher Day Peterson Volumes. I'll just tell you, there's the word stable. I'll drop if n-pointed curves. These are rational curves. It's not in the title. So it means you're looking at the multiply space in, of genus G, genus zero curves here with n marked points. And there's, there are multiply spaces, n, g, n, and some completion. And there's a volume form called the Vey-Peterson volume. And so you want the volume of this thing, and it's some, some number. So v, n is this number. And there, by the asymptotic method, you would find First of all, so that v, well, for some reason, it turns out to be convenient for the application to put n plus 3. You would find 2n factorial divided by a constant, exactly like in the Stoyminov thing. Remember, here, d factorial over, numerically, it looked like 1.5 to the d, but it was really z of 2. Here you find with the method 2n factorial to the power 1.0000. So remove it. Then you get a constant, which you can compute numerically uh, by the method. 
And the others you could also get, I mean, see, uh, so here I can put, a, you would get a, another constant minus something which doesn't matter at all anymore, uh, dot, 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 plus 0 0.019 over n squared and so on. This is what you would get with the numerical method. And you would get as many digits of that as you want. This is not what happened many years ago because it was before I thought of the method. I had no idea, and nor would I have thought of doing that. I didn't think about asymptotics. But uh, through some trick, th there was an equation. These numbers were much studied, in particular by Zograf, who had given a formula for them, but it's a complicated recursive formula, which leads to a nonlinear differential equation. And then I noticed that the first coefficients, the n, were very close to things called the Euler numbers. But they weren't equal, but using that, I made some change of variables. And it turned out with some strange nonlinear change of variables, you could linearize the differential equation, and so you could solve it exactly. That was my main conclusion. They, uh, Manin and Kaufman are both very high-level experts. So I'm not by space, and I'm not. But my contribution was to kind of solve this recursion and, and understand the numerics. And so actually, in the paper, this is uh, some explicit expression. Uh, so in the paper, we actually find this and give the Values, and I've never actually checked that the numerical method would, uh, would give this number to that number of digits. Or which I just looked at the paper. Yeah, I don't remember anything. In terms of Bessel functions and their derivatives. When I say their derivatives, of course, you only need their first derivative. Because the second derivative is a combination of the zeroth and first by the differential equation. So it's written in the paper that it's an explicit, but it's actually zeros. I think it's in terms of zeros. Uh, if I remember correctly. So you have to take some combination of Bernoulli volumes and you take the, you know, like the, like the derivatives of J1 and so on. So this is uh, that's the classical Vey Peter volume of this thing. But uh, so this is a non example, but where such numbers came here, this number is not at all easy to recognize. I don't know anybody alive who could take this number and say, aha, that's a combination of the zeros of J0 and J1 or something. I mean, that's impossible. But you can find it numerically and hope that someday somebody will have a theory and can check the theory. So this was, let's say, from my own work of many years ago. And the other examples, I have easily 10 papers in recent years where the asymptotics could be used. And they all have to do with, like this one, with moduli spaces. So I'll just mention two of the co-authors. Uh, they're all fun papers, but not for this purpose. But that was just a side thing. So this paper is 2018. This is large genus limits. So when people do multiply space, here it wasn't large genus. The genus was zero, but n was growing. So it was large, you know, uh, stably pointed curves, but with a large number of marked points. This is the, the, the title is even large lim uh, limits of Siegel Veach constants. That's something that comes up in dynamics and specifically in the theory of flat surfaces, of which I know a little bit because my co authors explained. I didn't know anything before, and it's not my field. But there are numbers, but the title tells you it's, it's an asymptotic statement. And there were various numbers. And this n that I'm going to write, it's probably 2g minus 3, but it's n is even and large. And here, we actually wanted to know the numbers. And finally, we, got, we have a proof of what's now written in this paper with Dawei Chen, Martin Miller, and myself. But the formula is exactly the sort. But you quickly notice that it alternates. So you just take out the minus of the sign. That's not very hard. And then you find n factorial. And then again, you find a power to the n, which is 2 over pi. But then when you find the whole thing, it turns out that it's convenient to have another 2 pi. I don't know why there are 2, and there's an n to the 5 halves. Maybe I miscalculated. Oh, sorry, this isn't a pi. This is an n. So there's a, an, there's a power, which is two, 2 over pi to the n. Then there's the square root of n, and the remaining constant is another 2 over pi. So it's the square root of pi. So it's best to put it like that. And now it starts with 1. Well, it wouldn't have started with 1. This, by the way, we already saw one example. It's very common when you find such sequences. You have the power series c0 plus c1 over n. c0 is some very complicated number like it was there. But if you pull it out, so it's a constant c0 times the power series starting with 1, then very often those numbers are rational, or at least much simpler. Well, here also, this. The original number would have had a square root of pi. Now there's no square root of pi, but it's already harder to recognize. This is now theoretical, but would be very easy to recognize numerically. The first two coefficients, as I told you, you expect the denominators always to be highly factored. So 24 and 1152 have only twos and threes in them. But the coefficients, 
are not just integers. So although that is the denominator, it's the denominator in the ring q of pi, or q of pi squared, actually, because the actual numerators, for instance, the second one, is 4 pi to the fourth minus 36 up to the ninth pi squared plus 9. So it's already a little harder to recognize. I think we would have recognized that because you'd have a lot of digits. And one of the things you try is a polynomial in pi. And there's an easy way. I'll talk about that in another course, how you recognize things once you have a conjecture where it might be lying. But, to, but here, in the end, we proved this. So this is a true theorem, but the asymptotic method would give as many terms as you want. And the last, I won't even give any of the results. It's several papers that I wrote simply because it's, it is, or rather it was, a colleague here, Boris Dubrovin, at CISU, died two years ago. One of the really great was one of the great leading mathematicians. So, and D. Young, who was in ICTP for, well, no, he was in CISU, but he visited here a lot. I got to know him here. And we wrote, I think, already five papers together. Two of them occurred post, appeared posthumously. I mean, after Boris had died, but he was a co-author. And we have three more coming, one of which will still have him as a co-author. So there's some, I'll just say, many papers on things like Horvitz numbers and also multiply spaces and volumes and large uh, genus limits. And in each of those, practically each of those papers, somewhere there's an asymptotic section. That's what people really want to know, what happens for a very large genus. And each time, we proved it in each case. These were theoretical papers. Well, we proved it having done the numerical method and knowing exactly how the answer had to be. That's very, very helpful when you're doing mathematics and you know you have to have something like this. It, it, you reject certain things they couldn't possibly give this and say it can't be quite like that. It has to be trickier. So I want to give you a kind of a spectrum of examples coming from different parts of mathematics with this method. You see, the final method is incredibly simple. You multiply by n to the eighth. You take the eighth difference, divide by eighth factorial, and you just see the first coefficient staring you in the face. That's how to get the limit. And if it's not accurate enough, you replace eight by a larger number. And if it's still not good, you, you use more terms of the sequence, higher precision. So you increase all the parameters, and you get as many digits as you want. And that, I think you'll agree, is so easy, you can't really forget it. You multiply by power of n, differentiate down until the constant appears before your eyes, and that's it. And you just you see it more and more digits. So that's the asymptotic trick. Actually, that was the main point of this whole course. I've taught this, I've explained that in other courses, but I want as many people as possible to know it because it's so useful. And so I, this whole course I started to teach the asymptotic trick. But it's kind of a triviality. And actually, there are many other fun things which I, I thought of afterwards that I could work into the course. So I hope you're still having fun. That, once again, is the only point of this course. It's not for any other purpose. OK, so if there are questions you have to ask in the previous four minutes, or next time, or you can ask. But if, if you want to leave, you're free to leave. And if you're not visible, of course, you're free anyway. So yes. OK, I was asked when people in the audience ask a question to repeat it because you have no microphone. The question is, is there some theory how to choose these numbers like 8? Certainly, I don't know of any. And frankly, it's not worth, uh, it's, it's not worth bothering. But let me try to answer. I mean, I've done this in hundreds of cases. I have a lot of practical experience. You try 8, you try 12. You look at the sequence of numbers, how quickly they converge. And you gain a lot of digits. And after a while, if, if it's too big, of course, you lose digits each time. It doesn't converge to anything. So you see it. And you don't have to try 8, 9, 10, 11. You try with a jump. You try 8. Then you try 18. So typically, when I do this, I have a Paris routine, which is now you know, just on my computer, called extrapolate for any sequence. I could show you the, the thing. It's like a one-line program, extrapolate of some sequence v. And then I put a number h, like, for instance, 8. And so typically, I'll make, I'll write it in Paris language, I'll make a step. H goes from 5 to 50 in steps of 5. And then I just print H in a little space. And then I print uh, the extrapolation using that number instead of 8. And, uh, and there's this extrapolation as a parameter. It tells you how well it's converged, because you've used uh, as many terms as your vector has. And then at the end, you see how, how big the difference is. And that's roughly how, if the last two terms differ in the, t in the 30th digit, then the, they bo can't both be right. So you have at most 29 digits. But typically, you're, you're almost there. 
So you can see just from the numerical output. So typically I'll write this, and then you see that the difference will be, you know, you'll have uh, the first sum 10 to the minus 6 is an error, 10 to the minus uh, 12, 10 to the minus 18. At some point, you'll have 10 to the minus 113. These are not invented numbers. That's quite typical. And the next time, you'll only have 10 to the minus 110. It starts getting worse. And you say, well, I want to have h to be around 40. And then you, you replace the first step 5 to 50. You look at that interval do, you know, from 35 to 45. You take the very best h, which for the length, so your sequence is finite length. That's all you've computed. And given that, you just optimize yourself, and that takes a few seconds to do. So I've never thought of the theory. And there, in a sense, there can be no theory, because we don't know anything about these numbers. These numbers come from a black box. Remember, we simply, that's the assumption that I wrote. You have an oracle. You can say, dear oracle, what is number A83? And it will tell you A83. And if you say, that's 100, it's please give me 200. It will give you 200. But it won't give you a formula. So there is no theory. We have no idea what these numbers are doing. We don't know what the next one will be like. So you can't expect a theory. And this is really about experimental mathematics. But in practice, I write this program with the stupid 4H. I should include it in my standard routines because I, I type this about once a week just to see what's the optimal age. And then, you know, typically if it's high precision, it'll be like this. You can go up to maybe 40. And then it'll be some extremely good accuracy. And then it starts getting worse. And if I'm happy with 113 digits, I stop there. And if I'm not happy, I take more. So basically, the answer is I don't know, and I don't worry about it. Because A, I don't know a method, and B, I think it's impossible if these are unknown numbers. You can't expect. So of course, if you know that these numbers that this ansatz does exist, and you know the growth of the CN. And that you can sometimes do, because once you've done not just the C0, but the C0 and the C1 and the C2 up to, let's say, C50 or C30, then you can do their asymptotics and make an ansatz that they grow like n factorial with a specific. Then you can make a theoretical estimate how many terms you should be taking. But that takes much more term than time than just doing it experimentally. So yes and no. If you know a lot about the growth of your of the coefficients of this asymptotic series, assuming it exists, you can. But in practice, you don't really care because the, the numbers themselves tell you uh, how well they're converging. Oh, and one last thing, which is very important, which I want to say. Let's say that it's expensive to compute the numbers, but it's not recursive. So I've like the numbers we had today, the AKN. I can compute them when D is 1,000. I don't need the values from 1 to 1,000. So if I compute for all n up to 1,000, let's say the last ones are taken in 10 minutes each, then that'll be 10,000, 10, what did I say, 1,000 or 10,000? 1,000 times 10 minutes. Well, maybe it's only the last 5,000 that took 10 minutes each. The earlier ones were faster. But we're talking 50,000 minutes, that's days. But if you can compute A1,000 in a reasonable amount of time, like 10 times, then what you do, you don't compute An for n equals 1 up to 1,000. Assuming 1,000 is reasonable in a short time, like 10 minutes, you compute for 1,000, 1,001, up to, let's say, 1,030. So you only compute 30 times, not 10,000. Then they're taking 10 minutes each. This will be 300 minutes. It's five hours, but it's not a month. And now you do the interpolation with those. You just, all, the only difference is you have to take, you have to remember that that's where you started. So you take 1,000 with the 8 times A, 1,000, up to 1,000 and 30 to the 8 times a 1,030. You don't need the others. You take the difference 8 times, uh, and then you'll get uh, well, of 22 numbers, because each time you lose 1. So this is delta to the 8. But actually, I would take probably delta to the 28, and I'd be left with just two numbers. And if those two numbers agree to 60 digits, you just assume that's probably about right. And so in practice, we use this all of the time because very often the definition is not recursive. If it's recursive, you'd have to do the first n. But if there's a closed formula but very slow to compute, as the thing we have today, it happens all the time, then you just compute some reasonable number, but not three. It should be 30 or 50 or 100. So sometimes I use 200 successive values, but starting at 5,000. So from 5,000 to 5,200. Then with 200 numbers, you get many, many, many digits. But you don't have to compute nearly as long as if you had to do all those thousands of numbers. So that's the other thing I, I wanted to, to say that's very useful to realize, that you don't need the entire sequence, uh, but only the last ones. Maybe we should stop because it's very late for people who want to go home. And for the people running the audio, they should also go home. So no more questions, but we'll stop. I'll turn off the mic. I say goodbye. and.